Vivan Sundaram is a painter, a sculptor, a photographer, a printmaker and an installation artist. I am at his residence in Delhi to speak to him about his work and what inspires it. Vivan, thank you for taking time out for us. Yes. Uh, you've been one of the pioneers of installation art in our country. What according to you would be good installation art and bad installation art? I'm glad you started with this topic because that refers to a very major break in my work. Uh, and what uh, made me move to this art form uh, was a feeling that uh, whatever I had been doing and what much of modern Indian art had been doing was based within the conventions of uh, painting and sculpture uh, in fairly conventional terms. And I think that there was a need to express things or to represent them uh, with very different sort of strategies. Installation art comes from the word install. Right. So anybody can install anything. But I think through its history, uh, you get very different uh, strategies of doing installation art. And uh, I think that it's the relationship between the part and the whole between understanding space, because space is a very important part of it. Right. Uh, the architecture, the environment that's there, whether the installation is within a, a room, within it's, it's in a historic building like I've done in the Victoria Memorial, or it is done outside. So these attributes in the way that the artist uh, selects what they do mm -hmm. and how they place it uh, in relationship to a configuration of things and objects. So it's not uh, a sculpture that's you know made in the round, mm -hmm. but it is spatial. And, uh, and it then takes everything into account, the floor, the walls, the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And then how the uh, viewer is then, uh, you know, the proposition that the viewer enters into this space. It then acquires attributes of of theater, of theatricality, mm -hmm. uh, of the still and the moving image. So there's a huge diversity of uh, procedures that it allows. And of course, it takes time both for the artists as well as for the public to grasp what these mean. Uh, because we have, you know, hundreds of years of painting and there are conventions, right. which then we have internalized in some way. But I think that installation art, you know, has come into the West uh, from the 70s onwards. And uh, now it becomes uh, one of the kind of almost uh, well-known genres of, of making art. Hmm, hmm. The Gulf War is, a, uh, is something that in that you've used engine oil and charcoal on paper, which is again a demarcation from the conventional medium that people use. What made you do that? And what went well, into that? That body of work actually is that moment uh, when I'm sort of moving away from the conventions of, uh, of drawing and painting, but it still has as its base drawing. And it's just that uh, the medium of engine oil uh, is, is a form of a fluid color, which could be even watercolor or acrylic. Well, how did you decide to work on that? Well, the engine oil came because of, of the Gulf War. Right. And in one sense, uh, there is something of an engagement which then over the last 25 years is about materiality. So the relationship of this handmade paper, which was in fact uh, uh, I got from the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad mainly, uh, a very strong uh, uh, rag content paper and the way that it absorbs uh, this oil. So the receptacle for receiving this burnt engine oil, mm -hmm. which, is the, which then frag produces the color because it's the carbon that's got burnt. Right. And uh, then it also allowed a form of action painting because I would put the paper on the floor right. and then throw it in uh, reference to action painting of what Jackson Pollock started doing. So it allowed this kind of procedure. It also then allowed me uh, to think of this war uh, which was a war fought from the skies and it also 
uh, allowed me to reconfigure what would be the painting as is referred to as a view of the world from a window. Now the concept of the map came into, into place because I stitched sheets of paper and, uh, and the map is an ever expanding uh, uh, form. And I think that this top angle view uh, had a relationship to the representation of that war, unlike the Vietnam War, was a war fought from the sky and very controlled, uh, uh, allowing these images to be processed by the Americans of a view of, of from afar and of distance. And I think that the burnt oil and the charcoal also is a form of uh, wood that is burnt and the hard mark of the charcoal and the fluid mark of the engine oil. And then in some works I actually used the engine oil and brought the drawing from the wall to the floor and placed a tray of engine oil. You've been to Doon School and then you went to Baroda for your study of art. And then you decided to go to Slade School in London. Uh, what was the choice behind that? Well, I applied for the Commonwealth Scholarship and I got it. Okay. So, uh, and so Slade School was uh, one of the better known schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I entered there at a very important moment, uh, it was 1966, and the art school had already uh, uh, started a postgraduate course. Actually, Slade School is one of the oldest art schools in England and was fairly considered to be a fairly conventional art school compared to the others. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the head of the art school, Sir William Coldstream, I don't know, made this very smart and intelligent move to have a very open program and a very open uh, postgraduate program. Okay. So you could study the history of art or the history of cinema or philosophy. So I uh, chose the history of cinema. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, why not the history of art? Because I had done that bit in, in Baroda, Baroda. Okay. which was okay. well known for it. Well, when you were in Dune, were you very sure you wanted to become an artist? No, no. I loved sports. I used to uh, love being a long distance runner. Uh -huh. But in my last year, I just decided to go into the art school just before my senior Cambridge exams because I wasn't sure how well I'd do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't include it as art. But yes, uh, some impulse took me there and from there I then went on to Baroda. You had no second thoughts after that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when you were in Baroda, you were very sure that you wanted to continue with this. Oh yeah, you know how parents like you to take things like applied arts or do architecture because yeah, yeah. that's something that's, uh, you know, can uh, give you a job as it were. Right. But it was very clear to me and my teachers that uh, I was cut out to be a painter. Okay. Uh, you belong to the same family of Amrita Shergen, you, she's your aunt and uh, you've done this series called Retake of Amrita uh, which is supposed to be a photo montage. Uh, can you tell our viewers a little bit about that process and how you went about doing this and what was the motive behind it in terms of creative work? Yeah, well just a little flashback. Uh, there's this large painting behind me which is called the Shergill family, the largest painting I've done. And already I was uh, using uh, photographs taken by Amrita's father, that's my grandfather. And then I did a, an exhibition called the Shergill Archive, uh, <coughs> which was just using uh, his photographs as well as constructing boxes. And in fact, in 1995, uh, a word that is now I mean, I've come to realize is a very key word now in art making practice. It is like going back to again the found object because the archive already exists and that how in its representation you are able to then configure from that data that you have, right. the archive, mm -hmm. in, in, in the way that is placed. So that was also an early example of installation art, a personal one unlike the memorial uh, which I did in response uh, <coughs> to what happened, uh, of the violence which I mentioned in, in Bombay. And then from that, uh, examining and looking at that material, uh, uh, in the early 2001, uh, somehow some intuition, I'm not a very tech person, mm -hmm. but I am, was interested in uh, as a narrative painter and somehow I thought that by 
uh, using what I call the digital wand mm -hmm. in, uh, in Photoshop. The digital uh, wand, okay. Wand, yes, the magical digital wand. Uh, I could then reposition from this uh, very remarkable set of photographs that uh, Umrao Singh took uh, to then uh, establish uh, relationships and configurations uh, within this bourgeois nuclear family. So there is a very intense relationship between uh, Amrita and her father. He takes self-portraits. Uh, he's a very handsome man. Uh, and uh, for 45 years, he took self-portraits. So there was a form of narcissism. And Amrita was also being photographed from the day she was born. And so this act of posing allowed me to reconfigure a whole sets of relationships, uh, the themes of... When you uh, say reconfigure sets of relationships, what would you mean in this case? Well, what I'm saying is that uh, I'm proposing a relationship of the body of narcissism mm -hmm. of uh, father and daughter. And th they are uh, <clears throat> mainly in Paris, uh, where she's gone to study uh, art. And in fact, the home becomes like a like a theatrical set and he photographs himself and photographs Amrita in that same space. And so they are s photographed separately, but then I, I bring them together. So I'm kind of conjoining their two uh, sensualities, their two uh, narcissisms, you know, in bringing them together and in a very sensuous, erotic way. Uh, and uh, one could use other words also. So this aspect of desire becomes very central to that and the whole uh, series gets charged in that relationship. Then there's of course uh, the artists in front of their work, uh, relationship of two sisters. So it allows a whole that's narrative. The, that's your mother. That's my mother, Indira. Right, right. And so in a way I can say that the analog photograph takes what was there and these are just fam from a family album. But I can set up a series of stories and in fact tell a lie to tell a new story or a truth. So when you talk about the digital wand being used in this, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that process, how you went about reconfiguring actually in using technology, which you say you're not very comfortable with, but having done it, what went into that? Well, you know, one of the successes of this was that I tried to make these photographs look as if they were like real photographs, that very little was actually changed. But when you look, then you realize that if I brought in the same photograph of Amrita uh, in one way, where she's sort of standing next to the father who's very, uh, shot himself in a very majestic uh, way, and she's standing next to him. And in the other one, with her long black hair and his white beard, I kind of actually almost superimposed them. So if you just take hair, the black hair and the white hair, there's already an eroticism in that. So then you see, well, she could stand very close, but it would be so close that it would almost be impossible that such a photograph could be taken. So I'm pushing the boundary uh, and suggesting, as I said, uh, the, the desire of bodies to touch each other, uh, to express something which is sexual. Uh, Vivan, your, one of your recent works is Gaga Waka. It's a, it's a series, uh, it's a project, let's put it that way. So firstly, what is the thought behind the name and then what is the project? Yeah, well, if I just go one step back, yeah. uh, it comes from a series I did uh, called Trash about creating a city out of garbage. Mm. So there was a whole uh, landscape. Uh, uh, which was created in my studio, 60 feet by 20 feet. And uh, it was just things, literally garbage, that uh, I created this city. And it was a photographic project about looking in perspective, looking at it from top, a top angle view, or a plan view, okay. or a Google view, and then digitally manipulating those shots. And then I thought that I'm interested to uh, recycle uh, this garbage uh, to make a kind of vertical statement and that by vertical I mean to have the human figure that stands. Okay. Okay. And then uh, I started thinking I'll make kind of sculpture out of this sort of uh, garbage. And from this idea of sculpture I thought well let me place it on the human body. And so the human body then becomes a mannequin or a model. Okay. And so then I bit by, put, uh, bit by bit I put one step 
into the other and I approached a fashion designer because I obviously wanted to craft these mm -hmm. and it was very clear to me that I'm not being a, a fashion designer because fashion you know 95 percent you know is about textile there have been many uh, famous fashion designers who use non-textile material yeah. but uh, I was going to use uh, the found object and the ready-made which was already part of my my um, makeup aesthetic makeup yeah. and my strategies to make art and uh, so that's how I proceeded to uh, find literally uh, things from the garbage dump you know old shoes mm -hmm. or rubber tires and then the found object is I go shopping around and <laughs> Chandni Chalk I find these wonderful red bras and they're made in China and so a whole spectrum of things started uh, producing uh, both the form and the meaning of that of that body of work and since there was a lot of uh, pleasure and play in it I in fact unlike the fashion designer would immediately make a sketch mm -hmm. I had the, the the dummy there and I would take an object and start pinning it okay. and then I had uh, two two three tailors and immediately I'd say now Abdul now isko jod do and put that so it was very much uh, an act of process of putting together and it's also a very modernist approach I mean an artist starts and puts something together and joins it and uh, that's an old strategy so slowly the, they get constructed the, the term gaga waka is very enticing so how did you come upon well this because there was uh, a lot of play and humor and fun uh -huh. so they're they're from two famous uh, women one is lady gaga yeah. and uh, shakira who sung the famous waka, uh, waka. Uh, song waka waka oh, for the okay, world cup okay. and i put them together so it became okay, gaga waka okay interesting what is your current project well let me say a postscript to that because i was also then converting these uh, things which were garbage uh, to make what would then could be considered beautiful beautiful garments and the word uh, trash and garbage and beauty you know do have a passage or a connection in fact even my whole city out of garbage uh, people were surprised that these photographs were so full of color they were in fact uh, a lot of fun and play and joy because partly I, the way that I manipulated them in the digital mm -hmm. so they became also from landscape pictures to kind of very modernist ones so here here again uh, when I produced this and then in fact there was a ramp show in the Lalit Kala Academy I had professional models mm -hmm. you know walking the ramp so obviously you are then treading into into beauty into again a kind of right. sensuousness and a um, lot of my work often questions what I have done before uh, a kind of critique of it or to take a step away from you know the direction I've been going so my work has been very non-linear but it keeps returning to sometimes questions which were posed earlier on how would you say you schedule your a day in your life today completely chaotic i am not uh, a disciplined uh, and uh, systematic uh, you're uh, not but artist. there must be some method to the no, madness. Th well well uh, the the method is that i do work in series as i said and i do uh, come up with uh, with ideas that I have and uh, sometimes they take six months one year two years you know to, to evolve uh, and so each uh, project if they are site-specific installations like uh, I did in the Victoria Memorial now 18 years ago and an interesting loop uh, to the Victoria Memorial is a project I'm going to do next October uh, in the Bhaudaji Lad Museum, which originally was called the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. So colonial building, but with very different functions than the Victoria Memorial. Uh, so that both of these become site-specific installations, uh, which means that the architecture, its history, uh, in a sense, frame or inform, inform the work. So that then becomes a history project, which my Calcutta project you know is now called it had different names and here again that was from history of mid 19th century to partition and it was exploring an aspect of mod modernity whereas here again in Bombay uh, with different obviously parameters and uh, and specific contents will also deal with that but uh, 
I will then intervene in that space, which has a, the Baghdadi Lard, which has a lot of uh, artworks already in it, but I will use the central aisle, which has been given to artists, to make an installation. So that is my upcoming project. What advice would you give to youngsters who want to think of taking art as a profession? Make art, but think about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The aspect of uh, thinking of posing questions to yourself and therefore to the viewer for me is, is very important. Uh, of course there is the importance of craft and skill and you produce it and there is you know great satisfaction in that but with my strategies I've never been very skillful even in my drawing or my painting you know quite self-conscious so I've never wanted particularly to explore something and go on developing to a point of perfection because perfection you know doesn't interest me mm -hmm. it's a moment comes and then I have to change gear I have to you know kind of introduce a kind of counter move to what I've done and over time uh, there are often great insecurities because people don't know what to do or you're experimenting and when will you kind of grow up and and uh, <laughs> you know find yourself and what you are but I think that uh, human beings are complex and they're made of very different uh, you know uh, contradictory elements and uh, I want to explore very much those contradictory elements which part of it are self-conscious but part of it also are very spontaneous. So I'm not privileging that I have a program and that I know what my next move will be. And uh, I do tread on that uh, un uncertain ground of what will appear, what, I mean, even these pot shirts. I, I have no idea creating these models, uh, what these, finally these photographs will look like. I do want to also have the models in the exhibition, but the main project is a photography project. So it's something entirely new. And I think that uh, this exploring the new uh, is something that when you look back, uh, both I notice a connection, but I'm always very excited when viewers notice connections. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it often happens. So others are joining the points. Whereas if everything is a thing that's known, then it says, well, you recognize somebody by their style and, uh, and you feel uh, good comfort in that. And uh, yeah, so I work with a lot of unsureness and insecurity, but then sometimes you have to take risks and at 72, I'm still taking risks. So many more ideas, many more questions and many more connections. Thank you, Vivan Sundaram. Thank you for the interview. The work behind me, which I call the plow, is based on an iconic work of Ramkinkar Bej called the Harvester or in other terms more realistically the Thresher and since it's related to agriculture he had made uh, in fact a nude woman and headless uh, in this remarkable sculpture so as part of my uh, project of using the ready-made or the found object uh, I have made almost the entire body of these very uh, large uh, uh, rubber pipes which are used for agriculture and then I have brought uh, the hands in fact swinging uh, a plow uh, and I've made the pedestal on, uh, on a base with large wheels so the sense of movement uh, also is quite dynamically expressed here. Wow.